welcome everybody to uh, our keynote speaker address. Obviously this year our keynote speaker is quite a big deal and we're very excited to have her here. Uh, We are so excited to have you here, Justice Ginsburg, and I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and told me how inspirational you are, how much they admire you, and so we really are appreciative of you being here today. Uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, really needs no introduction, but I will do my best to go through some of the highlights of Justice Ginsburg's uh, illustrious career. Uh, she attended Harvard Law School and received her Bachelor's of Law from Columbia Law School. She was a professor at Rutgers University and she was a professor at Columbia's Law School. Uh, Justice Ginsburg co-founded the Women's Rights Project of the ACLU and she eventually served as the ACLU's General Counsel. Uh, she served on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit from 1980 until 1993 and in 1993 President Bill Clinton appointed her to the Supreme Court, and she was confirmed soon thereafter by the U.S. Senate. Um, Justice Ginsburg, I think it's well known, has an affinity for New Mexico and for Santa Fe, and I will say that affinity is shared by the local people here in New Mexico and the lawyers of the New Mexico State Bar. Uh, also with her today is a woman who is also a big deal, she is one of our local products. She is out of the Modril Law Firm. Uh, Roberta Ramo is a shareholder at Modril, and she was the first woman president of the ABA. Uh, she is also... Uh, she served in that position from 1995 to 96. She didn't let that slow her down and quickly moved on to uh, grand things. Uh, she's received the ABA's highest award and she currently serves as the first woman president of the American Law Institute. Uh, she's a trailblazer in her own right. We are so happy to have you both here with us today and please put your hands together again to welcome him. Justice Ginsburg, we are all so thrilled to have you under uh, the beautiful New Mexico skies. And I know that you wanted to begin our discussions by a tribute to your friend, Justice Scalia. So I invite you to do that now. Good morning. It's, it's a pleasure to be here to have a conversation with Roberta Ramo. You've heard that she was the first woman president of the ABA, the first woman president of the ALI, but she is also the first person ever to lead both organizations, the ABA and the ALI. I hope you agree that it's fitting to open my remarks with some remembrances of my dear colleague, Antonin Scalia. Justice Scalia's death was the most momentous occurrence of the term just passed, the 2015 to 2016 term, and his absence will be felt for many terms ahead. There's a play about Justice Scalia. It's called The Originalist. And the script of the play opens with two quotations. The first one, words must be given the meaning they had when the legal text was adopted. And the second quote is, such is the character of human language that no word conveys to the mind in all situations one single definite idea. The first quotation is taken from Antonin Scalia and Brian Garner's Reading Law, the Interpretation of Legal Texts. 
The second was penned by the great Chief Justice John Marshall in McCullough v. Maryland. Justice Scalia would no doubt stand by the words he and co-author Garnett wrote. My view accords with the great Chief Justice's. No words convey precisely the same thing in every setting. And Justice Scalia, I believe, would agree that Chief Justice Marshall had a point. I'm not going to talk to you about Justice Scalia's distinctive jurisprudence. <laughs> Instead, I will speak of our enduring friendship from the years we served together on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit through the nearly 23 years we were two of the nine justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. There is a comic opera written a couple of years ago titled Scalia Ginsburg. In the preface to the libretto, the composer, librettist, described, asked, asked, the composer asked Justice Scalia and me to write a preface, what we thought of his opera. Justice Scalia, in his preface, described what he called the highest point of his days on the bench. It was in the spring of 2009. It was an evening at the Opera Ball held at the British Ambassador's residence in an elegant and spacious room with good acoustics. Justice Scalia joined two regular Washington National Opera tenors at the piano for a medley of songs. He called it the famous three tenors performance. <laughs> Both on and off the bench, Justice Scalia was a convivial, exuberant performer. Among my memories, an early June morning, 1996, I was about to leave the court to attend the Second Circuit's Judicial Conference at Lake George, upstate New York. Justice Scalia entered my space in chambers, opinion draft in hand. He tossed a sheaf of papers on my desk and said, Ruth, this is the penultimate draft of my dissent in the Virginia Military Institute case. It is not yet in shape to circulate to the court, but the clock is running and I want to give you as much time as I can to answer it. <laughs> on the plane to Albany, I read the dissent. It was a zinger. It took me to task on things large and small. Among the disdainful footnotes, the court refers to the Charlottesville campus of the University of Virginia. Unlike university si systems with which the court is perhaps more familiar, such as those in New York, there is only one University of Virginia. Thinking about fittingly restrained responses consumed my weekend, <laughs> but I was glad to have the extra days to adjust the court's opinion. My final draft was more persuasive thanks to Justice Scalia's searing criticism. In fact, whenever I wrote for the court and received a Scalia dissent, the majority, majority opinion ultimately released was clearer and more convincing than my initial circulation. Justice Scalia homed in on all the soft spots and energized me to strengthen the court's opinion. Another indelible memory, the day the court decided Bush v. Gore, December 12, 2000. I was in chambers, exhausted after the marathon. Review was granted on a Saturday Briefs were filed on Sunday, oral argument on Monday, and decisions released Tuesday evening. No surprise, Justice Scalia and I were on opposite sides. The court did the right thing, he had no doubt. I strongly disagreed and explained why in a dissenting opinion. Around 9 p.m., the telephone, the direct line, rang in my chambers. 
It was Justice Scalia. He didn't say, as he often did, get over it. <laughs> Instead, he asked Ruth, why are you still at the court? Go home and take a hot bath. Good advice I promptly followed. Among my favorite Scalia stories, in the spring of 1993, when President Clinton was mulling over his first nomination to the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia was asked a question to this effect. If you were stranded on a desert island with your new court colleague, who would you prefer, Larry Tribe or Mario Cuomo? Scalia answered quickly and clearly, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But within days, the president chose me. I recall, too, a very dark day. I was confined in a hospital in Heraklion, Crete, in the summer of 1999. It was the beginning of my long bout with colorectal cancer. What brought me to Crete? Justice Scalia's recommendation that I follow him as a teacher in Tulane Law School's summer program on that island. The first outside call I received was from Justice Scalia. Ruth, he said, I am responsible for your days in Crete, so you must get well, and is, is there anything I can do to help? Justice Scalia was a man of many talents, a jurist of captivating brilliance, high spirits, and quick wit, possessed of a rare talent for making even the most somber judge smile. The press wrote of his energetic fervor, his astringent intellect, his peppery prose, acumen, and affability. Not so well known, Justice Scalia was a discerning shopper. We were in, I worked together in 1994 for a judicial exchange with members of India's Supreme Court. Our driver took us to his friend's carpet shop. One rug after another was tossed out onto the floor, leaving me without a clue which to choose. Justice Scalia pointed to one that he thought his wife, Maureen, would like for their beach house in North Carolina. I picked the same design in a different color. It has worn very well. Once asked, how we could be friends given our disagreement on lots of things. Justice Scalia answered, I attack ideas. I don't attack people. Some very good people have some very bad ideas. <laughs> and if you can't separate the two, you've got to get another day job. You don't want to be a judge, at least not a judge on a multi-member panel. Example in point, from his first days on the court, Justice Scalia had tremendous affection for Justice Brennan, and Justice Bre Brennan was drawn to Justice Scalia. I miss the challenges and the laughter Justice Scalia provoked, his pungent, eminently quotable opinions, so clearly stated that his words rarely s s slipped from the reader's grasp. The roses he brought me on my birthday the chance to appear with him once more as supernumeraries at the Washington National Opera. The court is a pale place without him. Toward the end of the opera, Scalia Ginsburg, tenor Scalia and soprano Ginsburg sing a duet. We are different, we are one. Yes, different in our interpretation of legal texts, but one in our respect and affection for each other, and above all, our reverence for the Constitution and the court we serve. Thank you, and now it's time for the conversation to begin.
Well, that was simply wonderful. Uh, my husband teases me sometimes uh, about Justice Scalia because I knew him before he went on the court, and I remember telling Barry, he is the most charming person I've ever met. They'll all vote on whatever he wants. Uh, <laughs> happily, in my case, he was wrong a few times. <laughs> I was wrong. But you spoke, um, Justice Ginsburg, uh, about the constitutionalist that he was. And uh, he was famously an originalist. And uh, on the other, he, he very much uh, revered, as everybody in this room would know, and you would know uh, exquisitely, what he saw was interpreting the exact words of the Constitution. Uh, and I, on the other hand, uh, if you read Justice Breyer's book, uh, and sometimes in his opinion, there's a very different view of constitutional interpretation and how one should look at the words of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the history and uh, try to interpret them in a contemporary way. On that scale, how do you look as you're faced with questions of interpretation that are brought to you by contemporary life with words that were written 200 years ago? Of course, there are some provisions in the Constitution that are clear and certain, like how old do you have to be to run for president. But the Constitution also has some grandly general clauses. Now, let, let me say first about Justice Scalia, who is called the originalist, but he would use a French word, a French term to describe why he is an originalist. He would say, I am a, an originalist, faute de mieux, for lack of anything better, because it was his idea that if we stray from the literal meaning of the words, then we are making it up. That it is not the law that's speaking, but it's what some judge thinks the law should be. Well, our Constitution begins, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. My idea is we are still perfecting that union. And I have a, a historic view of it. In the beginning, in 1787, who composed We the People? I wouldn't have been there. Native Americans would not have been there. People who were held in human bondage would not have been there. We the people, the political constituency, were white, property-owning men. And I think the genius of our Constitution is that in the course of over two centuries, that term, we the people, has become ever more embracive and now includes all the people who were left out at the beginning. The Constitution has grandly general clauses, most notably the Due Process Clause, and the Equal Protection Clause. The fondest hope of some of the founders was that this Constitution would govern through the ages, from generation to generation. But for that to happen, ideas like due process, equal protection, Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishment, they must have growth potential. And one easy illustration that I give of the Eighth Amendment is if you've ever been to Williamsburg, Virginia, one of the high spots is the local jail where they show you the stocks and the other unpleasant um, means of disciplining people. Well, we wouldn't use that form of punishment today. We would call that, or 20 lashes, we would call that cruel and unusual. The original Constitution doesn't contain the word equal. You will find it no place in the original Constitution. 
even though it was the motivating idea of the Declara Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. But the founders knew that there was a terrible stain, the stain of slavery. So they didn't put the word equal in the original Constitution. Well, then there was a civil war to end slavery, and the 14th Amendment, for the first time, introduced the word equal. N nor shall any state deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. Well, that became part of the Constitution in 1868. If you were to ask one of the people in Congress or in, in the states that ratified the 14th Amendment, well, now, does this, does this mean now that uh, women can, married women can own their own property, can sue and be sued in their own name? can contract, make contracts? The answer would have been, of course not. This was a provision that was meant to end slavery and elevate African Americans to full citizenship stature, but had nothing to do with women. It took legislation, the Married Women's Property Act, to say that a married woman could contract in her name, sue and be sued, hold property. And yet, in the 1970s, the Equal Protection Clause was used to strike down many laws, federal and state, that discriminated overtly, that classified on the basis of gender. Why? Because the Equal Protection Clause, as I said before, was meant to govern over time. And today, women are just as much part of the political constituency as men. So that's why I take a dynamic view of grandly general clauses of what due process means and what equal protection means. Thank you. That, that's so helpful, and it leads me uh, into uh, something else that I had wanted to ask you. I'm very proud that in 1973, in New Mexico, we passed a state equal rights amendment that clearly does not allow for discrimination based on sex. At the time that, uh, along with many other people I see sitting here, uh, including Justice Daniels and others, uh, I used to have some hot conversations with my former law school professor, Phil Curland, who was completely convinced that I was wasting my time and that women didn't need this amendment federally or even in a state because he thought the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clauses simply covered everything. I'm curious to know in these many years since we failed to pass a federal amendment to the Constitution uh, that covered women's rights, if you feel there has been significant impact on what has happened to the rights of women over that period of time till now. The, the legal status of women has changed enormously. As of the time, this distinguished Professor Phil Curlin was speaking about the Equal Protection Clause, think of the decisions that the court had rendered, well, back in the, in the late 1800s. Uh, one brave woman, Virginia Minor, said, well now, I must be entitled to vote because I am a person, therefore I am entitled to equal protection and the first right of citizenship is to exercise the franchise. The court wrote in an opinion turning down her argument, of course you are a person and you are a citizen as well, but so too are children and no one would suggest Children should have the right to vote. <laughs> then we had Myra Bradwell, who qualified in all respects but one to be a member of the Illinois Bar. She was turned down simply because she was a woman. And the Supreme Court said that was all right. And th then there was uh, mother and daughter Gossett, who owned 
a bar uh, in Michigan. The Michigan legislature passed a law that said uh, women may not tend bar unless they are the daughters or wives of the owner of the bar. Well, Mrs. Gossert and her daughter, the, the father, husband was no longer around, and the mother was the owner. This law put those two women out of business. Some suspected that the male, all-male bartenders union had something to do with the passage <laughs> of that legislation. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court said, well, that's okay because everybody knows that bars are dangerous places. A woman would be at risk. Never deigning to notice that there was no restriction on women being barmaids, that is coming to the table and actually serving the drunks and standing behind <laughs> a bar. That was, that was a 1948 decision. And then in 1961, Gwendolyn Hoyt, who we would today call a battered woman, well, her case came to the Supreme Court. Her husband had humiliated her to the breaking point. She turned to the corner of the room, saw her young son's baseball bat, took it and with all her might hit her husband over the head. He fell against the stone floor. That was the end of their argument. <laughs> and, and the beginning of the murder prosecution. Florida in those not so ancient days didn't put women on the jury rolls. Gwendolyn Hoyt, her thinking was, if women were on my jury, they might understand my rage at that moment. And although they might not acquit me, maybe they would convict me of the lesser crime of manslaughter instead of murder. She was convicted of murder by an all-male jury. And when her case came to the Supreme Court, the majority said, we don't understand how she can be complaining about sex discrimination. Women have the best of both worlds. Yes, they don't get on the jury roll initially, but any woman who wants to serve can go down to the clerk's office, sign up, and add her name to the roster. Well, how many men, given the opportunity not to serve, would go down to the clerk's office and volunteer? Gwendolyn Hoyt must have been very puzzled by that decision, thinking about what, what about me and my perspective that I don't have the opportunity to be judged by a jury of my peers. My peers certainly would have to include women. So that was up to 1961. We were into the, quote, liberal Warren Court days. And yet 10 years later, starting in 1971, the, quote, conservative Burger Court was on a roll as far as gender-based discrimination. Uh, whether the discrimination was against a man or a woman, they got the message that it's wrong to divide the world into two spheres, that the man represented the family outside the home, and was the breadwinner, the woman took care of the home and raised the children. That separate spheres mentality that was reflected in dozens of laws. Why did the Supreme Court change in, in 1971? Well, I, they changed because society had changed in that, those 10 years. More and more women were coming into the workforce, not because they were feminists, but because if you want to do well by your children, you needed, you needed to, to earn a family. And the more women that came into the workforce, the more it encouraged other women to do so. And people began to understand that was once was perceived as a favor for women, like Social Security. There are benefits for uh, a widow, not for a widower. Well, some people looked at that kind of classification and said, who does this discriminate against? The widower, because the widower doesn't get benefits? Isn't the discrimination against the woman as wage earner who pays the same Social Security taxes as a man, but doesn't get the same benefits. 
for her family. Courts are reactive institutions. They don't make the controversies that come before them, but they do react to what's put on their plate. And there were uh, challenges mounted in the 70s that would have had no chance for success in an earlier generation, but that were big winners in the court in the 70s. And I, I think it's because the court was catching up to a change that had already occurred in society. Well, Justice Ginsburg, what you don't mention, uh, and that some people in this room may not know, is that uh, part of what happened is that we were lucky enough to have you come of age as an advocate, bringing some of the most important challenges uh, to sex discrimination in every way. And as I recall, of the six cases you brought personally to the United States Supreme Court, which resulted in a great enlargement of women's rights, I think you won five of them. I, I won't yeah. talk about the last Well, there, there was a six <laughs> that I won, and this is, this is uh, the equivalent of a hole in one for a golfer. We won one case on the basis of this petition for review, the cert petition, and the brief in opposition. The court thought we were so clearly right that there was no need for fuller briefing or oral argument. And what that case was, it involved a Utah law, um, an unemployment compensation law, that disqualified pregnant women. So if you, were, if you lost your job and you were pregnant, you didn't get any unemployment compensation, even though you were ready, willing, and able to work. So that, I, I count that as a, a sixth victory. Now, we won't talk about all the cert petitions that I filed <laughs> that were denied. Some, uh, some time ago, somebody said to me, uh, we were talking about uh, somebody we both know, uh, Elaine Jones and other uh, wonderful lawyers who have been uh, general counsel and active with the NAACP Defense Fund, and they were talking about historically the enormous import uh, for the rights of African Americans that the Defense Fund had. And they said, well, what do you think happened uh, that advanced women's rights so much? And I said, oh, we had Ruth Ginsburg. So <laughs> <laughs> but that, 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 that's very nice, but the truth, the truth is that I was born at the right time, and I had the skills of a lawyer. In, in the Turning Point case, the Reed v. Reed case, decided in 1971, we put on the brief the name of two women, Dorothy Kenyon and Polly Murray. These were women who were advocating equal chances for women in all spheres of human endeavor, but they were advocating at a time when society was not yet ready to listen. So we recognized that we were saying nothing new and that we were standing on the shoulders of the women who had been brave enough to say it when most of their audience tuned out. Justice Ginsburg, let me uh, turn to the court today a little bit. Um, if you were to listen to uh, especially television newscasters and pundits, and uh, if you were to read some accounts of the court, you would think it was much like the opera you saw the other night, and that is it was evenly divided between the Montagues and the Capulets, uh, that every decision was political, but when you actually look at the court, uh, I think the term before, I didn't check the statistics uh, this term because you just closed it out, uh, you actually voted with Chief Justice Roberts, I think something like 73 or 74 percent of the time, with Justice Kennedy over 80 percent, with Justice Alito, I think something like 72 oh, percent, uh, and with Justice Thomas, something like 62 percent. And so that shows in the majority of the cases there's a much more fluid line that happens. Can you explain to us, uh, would you explain to us a little bit about how majorities come to be formed uh, and tell us whether there's much changing after the initial opinions are circulated? And also, I think this audience would be interested in knowing who assigns uh, the opinions, who decides who writes for the majority and who writes for the dissent. First, on the statistics. Fortunately, I think, the U.S. Supreme Court is the final instance for all questions of federal law, not just constitutional questions. And 
the majority of the cases we hear don't have anything to do with the Constitution. They're dealing with dense statutes passed by Congress, like ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, the Internal Revenue Code, Copyright and Trademark. We deal with statutory interpretation most of the time. And in those cases, we don't line up uh, along party lines. Uh, the court is unanimous in about 40% of the judgments it renders. And it splits five to four in less than 25%. So we agree much more often than we disagree. But agreement is boring, and that's why the press tends to focus <laughs> on the five-four splits in, instead of the, the high degree of unanimity. And I think it speaks well for the court, considering the number one reason we will take a case is because other courts have disagreed on what the federal law is. And we conceive of our job as trying to keep the law of the United States more or less uniform. So ERISA doesn't mean one thing on the East Coast, something different uh, in the Ninth, Ninth Circuit on the West Coast. So uh, how did you asked about the opinion process. In a typical a sitting week. We sit Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We meet Wednesday afternoon to talk about Monday's cases. Friday morning to talk about Tuesday, Wednesday. The chief will summarize the case, say what he thinks should be the judgment. We go around the room, each one speaking in seniority order. And then if there is a majority, the chief well, if he is in the majority, he will assign the opinion. Friday afternoon, we get what I call our homework sheets, and it starts in reverse seniority order with Justice Kagan first. So the chief will write what opinion he's assigned to her. He would have consulted with the most senior judge in the majority when the chief is on the dissent side. And most often nowadays, that would be Justice Kennedy. Uh, and then, so there'll be cases assigned by um, a senior justice when, when the chief is not in the majority. And then in the fullness of time, the person assigned the opinion will circulate a draft to the court. It happens, not often, but uh, at least once a term, that the opinion author finds that the position he or she was initially taking won't write. And he has to adjust the opinion to take another tack. Well, the justice would then notify the court, and, and if there's no disagreement, we'll continue writing, writing the opinion. Then after the majority circulates, and by the way, all of our opinions are opinions for the court, because when an opinion circulates, you get what I call Dear Ruth letters, that is a colleague <laughs> will say, I will join your opinion if you drop footnote 13, because I think it's unnecessary. Or another will say, I will join if you cite my opinion in the such and such case. <laughs> and if it will do no harm, my view is, in it goes. Chief Justice Hughes had uh, thought about that, and he said, he always tried to write his opinions clearly so they could be easily understood. But if a colleague wanted him to put something in that he regarded as confusing, ambiguous, well, in it went, and let the law schools figure out what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I, no opinion I've ever written for the court comes out exactly as I would write it for I queen, but I'm not. I'm writing for not just myself, but at least for others. And then the dissent is circulated. Once in a rare while, 
the dissent will be so persuasive that people who were originally on the other side will join the dissent and the dissent becomes the opinion of the court. That happened to me only once, but it was a, a stunning success. My senior colleague, John Paul Stevens, assigned an opinion to me. I, it was just for the two of us in dissent. It was a criminal case. It circulated my opinion. Eventually, the decision came down six to three, but the two had swelled to six. And the original seven had shrunk to three. So, as a well-known man once said, it ain't over until it's over. <laughs> and hope springs eternal. So that's the opinion assignment process. Did I leave out something? No, that was, that was perfect. I, I have to uh, ask you now, because I, for a reason I'll explain, I have a kind of um, personal fascination with how the court decides to take cases. Uh, many years ago, right after the Bush v. Gore election, uh, Barry and I were in London, and our mutual friend Harry Wolf invited me to have lunch at the House of Lords. And as we were at lunch, he called his colleagues over and he said, Roberta's here, she's going to tell us everything about the election. So the first question they said is, well, will the Supreme Court take this case? And I said without hesitation, they'll never touch that case. <laughs> uh, tragically, I had to send him a one-line note that said, dear Harry, whoops. <laughs> uh, so since then, I have uh, watched very carefully. Uh, the cert process, even to an august group like this of lawyers and judges, is somewhat still a mystery. Can you tell us exactly what yardstick, uh, first what the process is and what yardstick the court is using to decide what cases it wants to opine on? Let me explain that in, at least since the beginning of the 20th century, the court has recognize that it cannot be an error correction institution. That is, it doesn't sit simply to right wrong judgments. The states, most of them have three-tier systems that do the everyday business of administering justice very well. And in the federal courts, there's the district court and the court of appeals. So we don't engage in error correction. The number one reason for granting review is that other courts have divided over what the, what the answer to the question, whether statutory interpretation or constitution. So when you have a split, um, generally we wait for a deep split, that is not the first two courts that disagree, we really are benefited from the range of views expressed by other courts. So when it, by the time it comes to us, we have before us a number of opinions by good judicial minds addressing the question. We also may, we know that this is a repeating issue. We want to take the case that has the best facts. All that has the best lawyering all that contributes to whether you grant cert. Now, Bush v. Gore, Roberta, I said the same thing that you did in Thanksgiving <laughs> of, of, of 2000. <laughs> oh, I feel so I said, much better. I said we wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole, and I was certainly wrong about that, but the majority thought the country was in agony. It was better to have the answer sooner rather than later. And I think it speaks well for our society, whether you agree or disagree with what the court did, it was accepted. There were no riots in the streets. Gore accepted that that was the result, that he wasn't, wouldn't gain Florida, and that the election was over. Now, I don't think it's fair to say that the court decided the election, because the Constitution, in my view, makes the House of Representatives the decision maker in such cases. And the House was predominantly Republican. 
at that time. So I think the end result would have been the same. It would have come later rather than sooner. Uh, let me just ask you a question about what the court is faced with now. Uh, there are eight of you, as you so movingly um, reminded us about Justice Scalia's absence. Uh, and in a few cases this year, you have come down four to four. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be on a court that's down one justice in practical terms? Mm -hmm. We tried very hard to avoid an even division, but in four cases that was just not possible. Eight is not a good number for a collegial court. The cases, when, when, when we split evenly, we issue no opinion. The decision of the court below is automatically affirmed that automatic affirmance has no precedential value for the, for the next case. So when we, we are evenly divided, it's equivalent to denying review in the first place. That's what it is. Um, there were important issues in these four cases that we were unable to decide. And they will come back again. I mean, one of them was the president's immigration policy. Uh, another was a law that Congress passed, first law of its kind that allowed tribal courts to hear civil controversies against non-Indians who had come on the reservation and caused problems, either committed a tort or breach of contract. The defendant in that case said, I don't have to appear before the tribal court because the Seventh Amendment guarantees the right to jury trial in civil cases. And the tribal court doesn't use juries. That was the argument when the court divided evenly over that. In, interestingly, the, the Seventh Amendment as we have two uh, jury trial provisions in the Constitution, Sixth Amendment covering criminal cases, Seventh civil cases. The court, although it has incorporated most of the Bill of Rights through, through the 14th Amendment to make them applicable against the states, has never said that the right to a civil jury applies to the states as well as the federal government. But anyway, that case will that issue is likely to come before us again. Another, um, the Supreme Court had a decision named Abood several years ago on what to do with workers who do not want to have anything to do with unions. The court decision was, well, they don't have to pay for the union's political activities, but they do have to pay for collective bargaining because that benefits everyone and the grievance procedure. So there's an allocation made of the dues. They don't pay for the union's political activities, but they do pay for things that benefit everyone. That was challenged um, by people who, who argued that any support of a union, any compelled support is equivalent to compelled speech. We divided four to four on that, so for, the, for now, the lower court, which had upheld that precedent, that division between political activity and activities that benefit all workers, um, that holds for the time being, but when we have a fifth ju justice, uh, the issue will no doubt come back again. Well, we all hope uh, that that problem will be sooner than later remedied, uh, which is something I know you can't speak about, but I certainly can. Um, let me ask you about sort of a new world of uh, matters that comes before the court. Uh, increasingly, some of the most interesting and important cases that come before the court come from the whole new world of the internet, gaming, uh, questions about where privacy ends or begins 
Uh, they're extremely complex technologically and technically, uh, issues not just of intellectual property, but all kinds of issues that have vast import in both commerce and our personal lives. Uh, everybody on the court uh, is not as lucky as you are. Uh, we're alike in uh, two ways now, I realize. I always say that the only reason I'm uh, at all like Justice Ginsburg is we both had a feminist husband. Mm -hmm. But I also know that we both have lawyer daughters. Uh, in your case, your daughter is one of the great IP scholars uh, in the world, really. But how does the court itself as a body keep up with these incredibly complex issues uh, that are often in front of you, matters of science, technology, mathematics? How do you school yourselves so that you can render opinions in these areas? Maybe I should preface this by saying my husband, who was a great tax lawyer, said that his he, th he threatened regularly that his next speech was going to be the Supreme Court's performance in tax cases. He thought it was <laughs> a very funny subject. <laughs> and my daughter has been critical of some of, some of our copyright and trademark decisions. It is intimidating when you're, you're faced with an emerging area, but we do have two great aids. One is we are never the first ones to consider the question. Other judges have grappled with the question. The next is we have lots of friends of the court and on, on, on important issues there will be um, briefs on both sides. Our briefs are color-coded so petitioner's brief is blue, government always gray, respondent red, friends pale green supporting petitioner, dark green respondents. So the green briefs, when I think of last term, I think we must have had about a hundred friend of the court brief in the, in the Texas Affirmative Action case. So we are uh, informed not only by the party's views, um, but by people who are expert in the area and file briefs to help the court understand the issue. And it, very often when we get a, a case involving the wild blue yonder, I, I'm struggling with it. I don't, I don't see the path through the forest. But you keep working at it and working at it. And one day, the light begins to shine. And, and you say, I, now I know how to get from here to there. Thank you. Let me ask you um, a kind of last question. Justice Ginsburg, all of us who are lawyers and judges begin our careers and at other times raise our hands uh, in an oath promising solemnly to support the United States Constitution. And with our licenses, we get back certain special privileges, client confidentiality and the privileges about appearing in front of courts and representing uh, our clients in whatever form they come to us. Uh, I wonder, as uh, a person from our very highest court, if there is uh, some kind of marching order that you want us to leave this meeting with, both as lawyers in the United States and also just as United States citizens. I think back to why did I decide to, to become a lawyer. I was a college student in the early 1950s. It was not a good time for our country. There was a vast red scare. It was the heyday of Senator Joe McCarthy who saw communists in every corner. And people were being hauled before the House on American Activities Committee or the Senate Internal Security Committee and quizzed about some left-leaning group that they had joined in depression years in the 30s. There was a blacklist for people in the entertainment industry. I had a professor for constitutional law who pointed out to me that our nation was straying from its most basic values 
but that there were lawyers standing up for these people who had called before a congressional committee. Lawyers who were reminding our Congress we have a First Amendment that allows us to think, speak, and write freely without a big brother government telling us the right way to think. And we have a Fifth Amendment that protects us against self-incrimination. So I thought that that was pretty nifty. That you could be, you could be a lawyer, and you could earn a living doing lawyering work, but you could also do something to make conditions in your society a little better. And my view has always been that lawyers, because they have a monopoly on certain services, have an obligation to give back. When I speak to law students, I say, if all you do with your law degree is you do a day's work or a day's pay, well, you, you're just like a plumber. You have a real skill. But you can't consider yourself a true professional unless you work for something outside yourself, something that will make things better for, for other people. I know in my own life I've gotten most satisfaction from doing things that I didn't get paid to do. So I think if, if the young people think of law in that way as a profession, it carries with it an obligation to use your skill to help improve things in your local community, your, your city, your state, your nation. That should be every lawyer's obligation. Justice Ginsburg, I don't think there's a person in this room that will leave here uh, without feeling that obligation anew and for everything you do for our country, our Constitution, and each of us, we thank you. Thank you, your brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, that's enough. <laughs> thank you all. And Justice Ginsburg, we are so delighted to have you here today. And as a token of our appreciation, we've got you a small gift. It's a, uh, an original weaving from here in Santa Fe. Hopefully it's something that you can use at the opera to keep you warm when it gets chilly at night. But we'd like to present you with that gift. And thank you so much for coming here today. Can I open it to show everybody? Hopefully it's the right size, too. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? If, if any of you have been to the opera in the last few nights, you will know how much something like this is needed. <laughs> and it will certainly come with me tonight and tomorrow night. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. <laughs>